My self-introduction is that my name is Harry Warren, and I'm from the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington, DC. And today I'm going to talk to you about the solar irradiance. And I feel compelled to uh, confess at the beginning of this talk that I'm uniquely unqualified for teaching. In my, my long career, I have spent exactly one hour in front of students. This is a lecture to Harvard undergraduates in 1999. So my experience is not even from this millennium. So in, in light of that inexperience, I thought I would begin by reviewing exactly what I want you to get out of this lecture. All right. So again, I'm going to talk about the, the sun's radiative output, the solar irradiance, and its variability. And, and many years from now, there are three things that I want you to remember. One is that the solar irradiance plays a central role in determining the state of the Earth's atmosphere, and is particularly important for the Earth's upper atmosphere. Second, that solar irradiance variability is driven almost exclusively by variations in the sun's surface magnetic fields. And finally, I want you to remember that the, the details of irradiance variability is determined by the, the structuring of the, the solar atmosphere. So what do we mean by this exactly? Well, as we've seen uh, earlier today in the solar photosphere, solar activity manifests itself as sunspots. Sunspots are dark, and that means that often solar activity is large, is, can, can be anti-correlated with the activity cycle. Furthermore, sunspots are generally not that large. This happens to be an extreme example. This is active region uh, 12, um, 192 from October of last year. And this is one of the largest sunspot groups of the last 30 years. But in general, sunspots are fairly small, you know, something like, like this. And so their ability to modulate the solar radiance um, at least for a mission that comes in the photosphere, is relatively small. Now, as we get up into the chromosphere and transition region, that thin layer between the relatively cool photosphere and the million degree corona, we see that the contrast between the quiet sun and, and active regions is much larger. This means that we have a much larger modulation of the radiative output over the time scales of a solar rotation or of the solar cycle. We also see that the irradiance becomes, or the emission becomes sensitive to very impulsive heating events like solar flares. As we go up into the million degree corona, the contrast between the quiet sun and, the, and active regions becomes even larger. And that means that we have an even larger modulation of the irradiance for million degree emission um, over rotational time periods and solar cycle time periods. And solar flares become a much more uh, important contributor to the irradiance. Finally, as we get up to the highest temperatures that we see routinely on the sun, things between uh, 3 million degrees and above, the contrast between the quiet sun and active regions is enormous. In fact, there's almost no 3 million degree plasma formed in the quiet sun. So the irradiance for emission formed at these temperatures is um, very strongly modulated by the presence of activity. And at times when there's a solar flare, it's actually completely dominated by the, that, that impulsive flare emission. Of course, all of this is modulated by the sun's surface magnetic field. Here I'm showing you a movie of the surface magnetic field. That's the, the different polarities are the, the, the yellow and the blue. Um, and uh, superimposed on this is a, a highly uh, processed image of the million degree corona. So you can see both of them simultaneously. And of course, if we want to understand irradiance variability, we have to understand the evolution and uh, the structure of the sun's surface magnetic fields. And finally that, oh, yes. I think it's an artifact of the way the, uh, the data was created, right? You have to measure line profiles in order to do this accurately, but this is done with filters. And so when the fluxes become really large, um, I think it's difficult to measure the, the sunspot magnetic field. So that's, that's an excellent question, though. So, so the, other, the final point that I wanted to make is that uh, the irradiance is an important problem, OK? So if you were an owner of this satellite and you wanted to know if this space debris was going to uh, impact your satellite, you would have to know the atmospheric drag over the next several days. And in order to understand the atmospheric drag, you'd have to understand how the solar irradiance is going to vary. Right? And it turns out in this case, you would guess wrong and you would not do a maneuver and you would lose your satellite. So, so those are my three main takeaways. Here's, here's the outline of the rest of my talk. Um, I'm going to talk about this, the total solar irradiance, 
And then I'll talk about the solar spectral irradiance, and I'll organize things sort of by, by temperature, uh, or really by wavelength. So I'll talk about the soft X-rays, the EUV, the ultraviolet, and the visible and infrared. I'll give a very brief overview of observations, and I'll discuss this satellite drag problem in a little more detail. Um, Stan Solomon is coming, and he'll give, uh, uh, and Jan is going to, to talk as well, and they'll give much more detailed uh, uh, presentations on the Earth's upper atmosphere. Then we'll have a, a break here, and I'll, I'll, in the second part of the talk, I'll give some more pragmatic information. I'll talk about proxy models, or proxies for solar activities, how they're used in proxy models. I'll make a quick gratuitous uh, comment on, on regression, and I'll talk about how we might use uh, the magnetic flux to forecast solar activity. Um, and then at the end, I'll give you know, my brief two cents on what I think you guys should be uh, learning right now. All right, so this is, just one second here. This is what we think, this is a, sort of our best guess as to what the, the spectral radiance of the sun is like, okay? So this is wavelength here in nanometers on a logarithmic scale, and here's sort of the, the magnitude of the sun's radiative output at each wavelength, um, again, on a logarithmic scale. And I say this is an estimate because we never actually measure the solar irradiance over all wavelengths simultaneously. So this is a model, and we're going to re rely heavily on models. All right, so the obvious first thing to do when you're thinking about the irradiance is what happens if we integrate over all wavelengths? You know, this is the, the total solar irradiance, the sun's radiative power integrated over the whole thing. So if we did that, we'd end up with a plot that looks something like, like this, okay? So in the space age, they put these cavity of uh, these instruments that measure the total solar irradiance um, as a function of time, and there have been a number of them. And uh, so there are two things that I want you to, to think about for this plot. They're two sort of funny things. Can anybody guess as to what you might take away from looking at this, this plot of data? So again, this is these are radiance time series from these different instruments over the last 30 years. Can anyone think of anything interesting to say about these plots? Jan is not allowed to talk. <laughs> they don't agree. That's, that's one very big thing. They're, they're all offset from each other. Any, any other interesting observations here? There's, there's certainly a solar cycle dependence. You know, we can see, like, here's the sunspot number, and when the sunspot number is high, the irradiance is a little bit higher. Anyone else? The variation is very small. Excellent, excellent. So you look over here on the scale, and it goes from 1360 to 1375, which is, you know, like 1% or, or something like that. And so the variation in these uh, irradiance time series is really small, like a fraction of a percent. Right. So I think what, what's happened is that of late, people have converged on this, this, these smaller numbers. The 1361, I think, is the canonical value accepted now for the total solar irradiance. And what people have done is they've constructed composite time series where they bring these things together. And in, for the most part, they agree. But there are some levels, some areas of disagreement, like what exactly is the TSI at solar minimum. Um, but again, you, you know, there's, there's more or less agreement on this. All right, so let's look at some measurements in a little detail here. So this is, this is a measurement of the TSI from the, the source instrument on, on uh, or the, the, the TIM instrument on source over this period of from October to November 2003 where we had these enormous active regions um, uh, on the disk. And you can see the TSI actually falls as these active regions proceed across the disk. Now I want to stress that it's not, so the contribution of activity isn't always negative. If you look very closely at the limb around these sunspots, you'll see that there are these bright faculae. So the, the uh, faculae are, are magnetic elements, and they're actually bright. And so you have a competition between sunspot darkening and facular brightening, and that determines the, uh, the variability. And that's also one of the reasons why the variability is so small, because you have this competition going on. But in general, you get very small modulation in the irradiance, even when you have very large changes in activity. So in fact, here's, here's some uh, soft X-ray measurements. And you can see orders of magnitude changes in the soft X-rays. All right, so why would you want to really measure the, the total solar radiance? What can you do with it? Well, as Andre said uh, or in his talk, he mentioned that some people say, well, maybe the grand maximum is led to an increase in, in surface temperature here. 
And uh, similarly, you might have the question, well, what happens if we go into a grand minimum? What will happen to the temperature? So uh, the very simplest thing you could do, and this is work done by Judith Lean, is you can make a, a very simple um, regression model where you take the, the TSI time series and you take uh, other contributors to the, the surface temperature like volcanic aerosols and, and things like the El Nino oscillation and you combine that with the, uh, the greenhouse gases and you can model fairly accurately the temperature anomalies that we've seen over the last 30 years or the last you know, 100 years or so. And the importance here is that now you can quantify the contribution of, of irradiance variability to surface te temperature anomalies. And you can see up here, everything is, is, is on the same scale. And the solar irradiance over a solar cycle you know, does make a significant contribution. It's like 0.1, which is com comparable to some of these other contributors. But you can also imagine that if you, if you uh, put this to zero, it's not going to be able to uh, overwhelm the secular rise in greenhouse gases. Similarly, you, you wouldn't be able to, uh, just by adjusting the magnitude, you wouldn't be able to in, in, uh, create this, uh, this uh, uh, secular rise in the surface temperature. All right, so that's, that's my two cents on the totals, total, total solar irradiance. I'm certainly not an expert. Um, my, my areas of interest is more the spectral irradiance. Now, that is when we consider the irradiance and its variability at these, these different wavelengths. So as I said, let's, I'm going to start and do things by wavelength. I'm going to start here in the soft x-rays, and then we're going to move up. And we're going to basically look at the morphology of the solar atmosphere as a function of these different wavelengths. So here we are in the, in the soft x-rays. These are very, relatively short wavelengths below uh, 50 angstroms or 5 nanometers. And this emission is all formed generally at very high temperatures. And because it's formed at high temperatures, the contrast between the quiet sun and active region is enormous. In fact, it's even larger than what, you, what you're seeing here. This is a logarithmic plot. So there's, there's a, a tremendous contrast between um, the active regions and the quiet sun. And this leads to very strong modulations over the solar cycle and over a solar rotation. Another important point is because uh, the contrast is so large, flares can contribute significantly to the variability. And I'm not going to talk too much about the formation processes for these lines because that's a really complicated subject and would require sort of a whole lecture in itself. But this, is, this emission is what we call optically thin. That is, once a photon is emitted from an atom, it basically continues on until it reaches your, your detector. And finally, ironically enough, there are a very limited number of spectrally resolved uh, measurements. Oh, I guess I wanted to illustrate with this slide the irradiance variability during a flare. This is actually a defective plot in two ways. It's slightly uh, longer wavelength, so this is not really the soft x-rays. And I don't have a scale here, but this is, this is a logarithmic scale. And basically what it's showing is that these are all high temperature emission lines, iron 18, 19, all the way up to iron 24. And in a flare, you get this enormous increase in, uh, in the emission from this small region on the sun. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Real quick, was that data or simulation? That, that, was, uh, that was Eve data. So this is, this is uh, pure observation. Yeah. In the semester on the STO satellite, No, Eve, Eve provides uh, spectrally resolved observations beginning around here at 60 angstroms or so and continuing all the way up to about 1,050 angstroms and uh, has, has a spectral resolution of about one, one uh, angstrom. I'll, I'll show you some spectra in a, in a second. It's, it's full disk, no spatial resolution. All right, so here's a, a very simple plot of uh, soft X-ray images. These are from the Yoko SXT um, instrument over a, a solar cycle. And we can see this is really well correlated with the presence of surface magnetic field. Solar maximum, lots of magnetic field, lots of flux. Solar minimum, very little magnetic flux, very little emission. So as I said, there's really no um, uh, continuous spectrally resolved irradiance measurements in this wavelength range. What we do have are things like the GOES soft x-ray band. So if you go to the web and you see, oh, there's a flare, usually what they're saying is that there was a strong increase in this GOES 1 to 8 angstrom band. Um, so this is an instrument on one of the GOES satellites. And so what I've done here is I've taken all the data during the SDO era and I've plotted a daily average. Um, and you can see the enormous variability. This is a logarithmic plot. 
you're getting basically three orders of magnitude in, in the, the variability of the soft X-ray flux at these, these wavelengths. Now, the absence of observations is uh, something that we would like to, to plug in this wavelength range. And, and uh, Amir Caspi and Tom Woods flew this uh, nice X123 silicon drift detector that made measurements in, the, uh, in this wavelength range. And so these are some of the, the first spectrally resolved observations that um, we've had in a long time. And there's, they're preparing a CubeSat here at, um, at last that will launch fairly soon and return these things uh, um, fairly routinely. Now, as I'll talk about later, one of the things that we can do is we can make up empirical descriptions of the solar atmosphere, like how much plasma do we have at each temperature? And we can use that to sort of validate that, use these observations to validate that approach. And the reason why we need these spectrally resolved observations is that the, the cross sections, and I'll talk about this in more detail a little bit later, the cross sections in the atmosphere, so these are the O2 and N2 cross sections for processes in the Earth's atmosphere, have this, uh, have, have structure in it. They're, they're not constant. They vary with wavelength. And so you really need to know, is the variability occurring here or over here? And if you don't have that information, you can't accurately model processes. Yes? That's a very good point. This is just arbitrarily scaled onto oh. the, the plot, just just so, so you could see the the spectral dependence. But but it would be measured in in barns or whatever. Okay. Um, all right. So let's go up a little bit in wavelength. This is the extreme ultraviolet. We were just talking about the soft X rays, and this is a really really interesting wavelength range to consider. Uh, we have a, the full gamut of chromospheric, uh, transition region, coronal, and even flare emission in these wavelength ranges, or in this wavelength range. Again, it's, it starts around 50 angstroms and goes up to about 1,200 angstroms. Now, this emission is optically thin, as I said before, as well as optically thick. And by optically thick, I simply mean the photon is emitted from the atom for whatever reason and interacts with other atoms along the way. And so everything becomes uh, really complicated, and you have to do radiative transfer. Um, the, as we'll see in a second, the, there's sort of a moderate contrast between quiet and active sun because the, these are all formed at more or less lower temperatures, and this leads to a much more moderate variation over our solar rotation and solar cycle uh, measurement. So here's a blow up. Earlier, we, someone asked about like, wh what does Eve observe? This is, this is sort of a full Eve spectrum at, uh, at one angstrom spectral resolution. And you can see there are all, many, many emission lines. There are also these continuum processes, like the Lyman continuum, the helium-1 continuum. And again, the, the observed spectra are combinations of optically thin lines, like, say, carbon-3, and optically thick lines that depend on radiative transfer, like helium-2304. So we can blow up a wave, this wavelength range even more. There's a, a spectrometer on the Hinode satellite that, that does really high spectral resolution over two limited bands. And um, basically, this shows you the sort of the, the spectrum in its full glory. This is 22 milli angstrom spectral resolution. And you can see how densely packed all of the, these spectral ranges are with, uh, with emission lines. And one of the things I, I, I guess I wanted to point out as well is that when you see these movies, these AIA movies, basically what they're doing is they, they have telescopes that are, are, are coated with these special coatings, these multi layer coatings that have these relatively narrow. Um, uh, responses, right? And so what that allows you to do is sort of pick out some emission line. But, but it's always important to remember that they're not delta functions. You're really integrating everything under this curve, and, and that's what you're seeing in the movie. So this is an example of 195, and if you had a band pass at 284, it, it would look something like this. I'm sorry? Uh, I don't know. That's, that's just a, a property of the filters. It's, it's basically you're just depositing materials on to uh, layer by layer to, to build up that response. All right, so let's look at uh, some emission, you know, over a, uh, a solar rotation, right? And again, as I've been emphasizing, you know, for a very high temperature emission that doesn't occur in the quiet sun, the contrast is enormous. That means the rotational modulation is, is enormous. However, most of the corona is filled with million-degree plasma. 
And so the rotation of this active region, even a large active region like this 12192, doesn't uh, dramatically impact the, the irradiance over a solar, solar rotation. Here, here's some examples of images that illustrate uh, irradiance variability over a solar cycle. These are our um, full disk mosaics taken with this ice spectrometer. So this is really pure, spectrally pure iron 15. And you, again, you can see the enormous contrast between solar minimum uh, plasma at, at say two and a half million degrees and solar maximum. Whereas for these lower temperature lines like silicon 7 and iron 12, the, the contrast is not all that great. So again, you have much lower modulation. Which, which number is the 15? The, the 15 and the 12. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So I'll, I'll briefly explain what this means. So iron, like if, if it was iron 1, that would be neutral iron, right? And so iron 15 means that the electron temperature is, is high enough that it can strip off 14 of the bound electrons for iron. So obviously, those electrons have to be very energetic. So they have to have a temperature of about two and a half million degrees. Isn't it 26? Out of 26. So, so you, if you raise the electron temperature, you can go to higher ionization stages like iron 16. You can go all the way to iron, um, you know, the, in the EVE data, you get all the way to iron 24. Right, and this wavelength is, is, there's a transition, right? So it's just in quantum mechanics, there's a, a transition in, in this bound state where the electron is collisionally excited, it bounces up, and it spontaneously decays, and out comes your photon. And for iron 15, there's a transition at this 284 angstrom. And so by building an instrument that can observe that, you get very rich information on the, the solar atmosphere. All right, here's just a simple example of, of how things change in the transition region. Remember, the transition region is, is one of these thin layers that uh, connect the photosphere and the corona. And you can see that the morphology of the transition region is really different, right? You're, it's filled with low-lying structures. And, and also, in the quiet sun, there's ample, ample transition region emission, and so the contrast is not all that large. Here's some more examples of this. Here's a, an AIA movie in 304. Um, here's a, uh, an image, you know, in a spectrally pure, um, optically thick emission line. And again, the point is that there's not a lot of contrast between the, the quiet sun and the active region. So let's bring this all together. Let's look at some irradiance time series. So here we're showing iron 16, 14, 12, and helium 2. So we're going down in temperature. And, you know, they've all been normalized to sometimes uh, relatively low activity in. Um, in the SDO mission, right? And what you can see is they all basically look very similar until you look at the scale here. And so iron 16, this is a, a, a relatively hot line. This is uh, gonna be dominated by active region emission. And so this, the solar cycle and rotational modulation is very strong. Whereas when you get to helium 2, 304, you have a much lower modulation, um, you know, because the contrast is not as large. And so this, this scale is, is, is much smaller. So, and again, just, just to emphasize, there, there are two dominant modes of variability. One is the solar cycle, going from quiet sun, where there are almost no active regions, to very high levels of activity during solar maximum. And then there's this solar rotational modulation. That is, there's an active region on the disk, and as it comes rotating around, you see a very strong increase in, uh, in the irradiance. Yes? It's, it's all basically quantum mechanics. It's the, it, it is sort of uniquely determined by the quantum mechanical properties of the emitting atom. So it's not, this, these are really are nuclear processes. So here, let's, let's go up a little bit more in wavelength. This is the ultraviolet spectrum. Uh, that, that starts at about 1,200 angstroms or 120 nanometers and goes up and begins to peak around 4,000, which is basically the visible. 
and we see here the emission, the spectrum is, is this combination of some emission lines, this very strong continuum. This is a logarithmic plot. And so it goes up by orders of magnitude um, as you go from, uh, from these emission lines here at, at, at 1,200 angstroms up to the continuum at 400 nanometers. And you also see lots of absorption features in the spectrum as well. This is data taken from the, the SUSIM instrument on, on URs. So this is, let me back up a step here. So here are the calcium 2, H, and K features here in the spectrum. And on Hinode, you can make a little filter, and you can observe this directly. And you end up with an image that looks something like this. So again, this is sort of representative of the photosphere, where you have, uh, you see sunspots, you see um, uh, contributions from strong magnetic elements, and you also have a fairly strong contribution in the background. So when you go to look at a radiance time series, you see uh, you know, rel you know, relatively large changes in the modulation. So here, this on, over here, I'm showing Lyman alpha. So we back up a, a step or two. Lyman alpha is the, the, the strongest emission line in uh, the, the spectrum. Right? And we look at a, a, a time series, and we see a relatively strong modulation in uh, the irradiance in Lyman alpha over a solar cycle. Right? Now, if we go to these longer wavelengths up here, say 250 to 300 nanometers, we have much, uh, a much smaller contrast over a solar cycle. In fact, if you look at these numbers, I mean, here you're going you know, basically a factor of two, and here you're only going a few percent over the solar cycle. So here we get to uh, the visible, all right? So we've gone from the x-rays to the EUV to the UV to up here around the visible. And here's a question for you. It, 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 you know, if, when you plot the spectrum, it turns out that you can fit it really well as a black body, right? So you, if you have a black body a spectrum with an effective temperature of, of 5,770 degrees, you can fit the observed spectrum fairly well. Does it seem sort of odd, though, to describe the sun as a, a black body radiator? Does anybody have any idea why that's a good approximation for the, the sun? Sarah actually gave you the answer on, on Monday, or Tuesday, actually. Does anybody remember exactly what a black body is, the, the conditions? And basically, you need everything to be in, in thermodynamic equilibrium. and there's another, another aspect to it. You have to have a very small loss rate, right? But you'd think, well, I mean, the sun is, is ra radiating like crazy. How could this be a black body? From the, well, this, this is actually for the whole, the whole solar irradiance. So it's not specific to the sunspot. In fact, the sunspot would, would cause a deviation from the black body. Exactly. That's, that's my interpretation, is that the, the photons are essentially trapped in the sun. It takes thousands of years for them to get out. And only the very top layer, that very thin layer, is, uh, is radiating. So that's why, why the sun is well described as, um, as a black body. All right. So. What we've done is we've, we've basically gone in wavelength from the shortest wavelengths up to the longest wavelengths. And what this plot does is it, it sort of illustrates the, um, the temporal and spectral coverage of various uh, uh, observatories. So clearly in the 19, early 70s and 80s, they just started launching these things and they ran into uh, problems like maintaining the, the radiometric calibration, which is still you know, a significant issue. But at, over time, we've developed much better coverage of, of this spectrum, right? So basically, each plot here, and this is something that uh, Jeff Morrill at NRL put together, you know, we, we see the, the coverage in time becomes more continuous, and the coverage in wavelength becomes more continuous. But we still have a big gap here down at soft x-rays, where most of this, these observations are sort of broadband observations. All right, so what happens to this radiation? Again, this is something that uh, Jan Soika is going to talk about um, later in the week, and, and uh, Stan Solomon is going to talk about. 
but I thought I would go over very briefly. So here's, here's the Earth's atmosphere. Since this is not a, a Navy presentation, we, we left out all the ships. But when we presented this to the Navy, we put in lots of boats. <laughs> and so basically what we have here is uh, altitude. Right? And you can see these, these different spectral domains that I've, I've talked about. And where, uh, where this radiation is deposited depends on the atmospheric processes, like I was showing in that slide early on, like O2 and N2 disassociation. That would be um, some of these x-rays. And that means that th those, that emission is, is deposited at, at fairly high altitude. Whereas, of course, the visible and IR penetrates completely through the atmosphere and ends up in the troposphere. And you get you know, various things in between. Here's some density profiles for the Earth's atmosphere. So this is basically uh, log density as a function of height. And you can see things um, falling off. You can also see the dominant contributors change as a function of height. Um, the ra this radiation also creates the ionosphere, you know, um, which is something Ion is particularly interested in. Now, at the very uh, highest heights, at the largest altitudes, the density is really weak. Right, it's very small. It's dropped off by orders of magnitude relative to the troposphere. And now, that, these layers of the Earth's atmosphere are coupled to the X-rays and EUV. And I've, as I hope I've demonstrated to you, these, these spectral uh, regions are highly variable. So basically what you're doing is you're coupling highly variable emission from the sun to very tenuous gas on the Earth. And that leads to very strong modulations in the conditions in the Earth's upper atmosphere. So for example, in the, in the thermosphere, this, this top layer, the, the temperature goes from, you know, say, 500 Kelvin at solar minimum to 1,200 Kelvin at uh, solar maximum. So these are huge modulations. And so that's why when you come to this problem, the orbital debris problem, uh, a detailed understanding of both the Earth's atmosphere and the irradiance become important. Now, one thing you may say to yourself is, Harry, if I went into space, I would not see it full, filled with these green ellipses that are gigantic, right? Space is empty. What are you drawing here? Well, these are actually, you know, could represent uh, very small objects in space, but we don't really know where they are, right? So the, people routinely track these things, but they don't track them continuously. So what you'll do is you'll make an observation, you'll put in, uh, this thing into your, your catalog, and then when you want to know where it is, you'll have to do a calculation. You'll have to say, all right, here's where it was. This is the density. This is the ballistic coefficient. And then I think it's going to be, I think this object is going to be over here when this guy comes by. So there's nothing to worry about. So these error ellipses are really significant. They're like 150 kilometers, or like the size of Long Island. So if you went up into space and you saw Long Island floating around, you, you would be wor pretty worried. Right? And again, <laughs> in the, uh, in this particular instance, um, you know, there was actually a collision that led to the creation of a lot of orbital debris. All right, so here's, here's a plot of the orbital debris as a function of time. And obviously, this, this has a, yes? So the, the red dots, were those actual debris that were being tracked, or is, was that just decoration? <laughs> that's decoration. I think that's, that's uh, an artist's conception of the debris field. It turns out it's really difficult to, you know, task instruments to make measurements and get everything into the catalog and all that. Um, so here's, here's a plot of the, the number of uh, objects, rogue elements, or uh, rogue objects in space. It's a function of time. And you can see it has a bad trend. You know, there are lots of sources, but there are very few sinks. All right, these things don't reenter all that often. And things like the iridium cosmos collision lead to a significant increase in, in the, the debris population as did the, uh, the China anti-test satellite. Uh, people have pointed out to me that the United States in the 1980 actually picked on an NRL satellite um, to, and shot it down in one of the earliest tests of, of these sorts of things. But it was done, I think, at relatively low altitude. And so there wasn't a, a significant increase in the, in the amount of debris. All right. So in order to, to make any progress on this orbital debris problem, you have to couple two things together. You have to couple an understanding of the, the solar EUV uh, irradiance. And over here, we're showing just a, a gratuitous little movie from SDO showing uh, you know, solar rotation. And you can see here's the, the total irradiance measured uh, from the time C instrument. Right? And so here's the irradiance going up as these big active regions uh, rotate onto the disk. 
And then the irradiance will come down as they rotate, a, rotate away, and you see a, a slightly more quiet region on the sun. And over here, what we're showing is uh, calculations from the NRL MSIS um, neutral density model. So this is density as a function of altitude and sort of an average, excuse me, average density um, as a function of time. And so you can see this change in the, very, uh, in the irradiance leads to dramatic changes in the density. You can see the density rising. So if you have a, a piece of debris here at a, a given altitude, the, the atmospheric drag, one of the primary non-conservative forces acting on, on this thing is, is going to increase dramatically, right? Now, the final point I want to leave you with here in this first part is that <clears throat> as important as the solar irradiance is and the, the thermospheric density is, it's very difficult to make progress in this problem by considering things in isolation, right? We might think that we're going to go out and do this great work and we're going to make a much better um, model or observation of the solar irradiance or we're going to make a much better model of the, the thermosphere and its, its density variation. But really, there's a lot more to the, the problem than that, right? We, we have to integrate ourselves into a, a much larger community to, to make progress, right? We need to know things like the uh, ballistic coefficients for all of these, these objects. We need to have some idea of how these things are actually tracked in reality, how these catalogs are formed and maintained, and exactly how collision avoidance is, is done. So and I think this is, uh, this is an important point because it sort of reflects something that you might think about when you're thinking about your career, right? It's, n it's often not enough just to make progress on your problem. You have to integrate it into, you know, the, the community at large. So that's the end of part one. We're here at the break. I guess I'm, I'm done a little bit early. Uh, of course, we have time for questions. And in the second part of the talk, we'll we'll discuss these, these elements, again, more, perhaps more practical aspects of the solar irradiance and its variability. So, any questions? Or any more questions? Yeah, the, uh, my understanding is that the Air Force does that. They have the Joint um, Space Operations Center where they actually run models and, and make predictions. They provide that to uh, all the operations? All, all over the world. Yeah, and you can, you can actually get the, and I'll show, I'll show an example of it in the, in the next talk. They, they do, and, and as part of the Hinodi project, we've been involved in this because we get, we get these messages. They actually send out, and I went to a, a conference in Hawaii on, on this sort of thing, and apparently they send out 1,000 conjunction warnings every day. So you get these things, it's like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And as far as Hinodi's concerned, the, the first time we actually made a maneuver, and in, in doing the maneuver, we accidentally sh shut off all the instruments. You know, and it, it took about a week to, to get everything going. And on the second time, they, they couldn't get everything organized, and they basically had to just hope for the best. So it's a, it's a very high stress uh, situation. Yes. I, the short answer is yes, we need spectrally resolved observations below 50 angstroms. So that's, that's important. I feel like I could defer that question to Andre, but I'll give you my answer and then, and then he can uh, chime in. I think it's not completely unprecedented. If you go back to 1900, you see similar sunspot numbers. I think there's some debate whether the EUV flux is at historical minimums. There's some indication that it's been declining uh, secularly over the last 30 or 40 years. And, and uh, the last solar minimum may have been a local minimum in terms of EUV flux. It's not clear. Yeah. 
I think in terms of the UV irradiance, it's very difficult to quantify because we don't have historical measurements. But I'll let Andre chime in if he wants to. Yeah, I would just say something really brief. If you compare Okay. All right, the front of the room. Any questions? Um, the short answer to the first question is to build better radar. Okay, how do you count? How do you count the debris population? And and basically, they're they're working on building better radar that will detect things down into the center meter range. So that's, that's the short answer. And then cleaning them out, if you could invent that, <laughs> it might even be better than Google, OK? <laughs> a good, strong solar maximum. A good, strong solar maximum would definitely be helpful, yeah. at least at the lower, the lower latitudes. So. So, so now can we? I, I am aware of that, but not in detail. I bet Carl knows a lot more. I, he's hiding in the corner. Now that I think of it, I, I looked at Tom Ayer's slides, and I think he will talk about this in his talk. All right. Well, with that, it's time for our break.